Welcome to the Bare Essentials Podcast, where the talk is real and hibernating on your goals is not an option. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Charles Wallace. I'm extremely honored to have this next guest. He is founder and CEO of Naked Warrior Recovery, a CBD company focused on the recovery of veterans and first responders. He is a retired Navy SEAL with 26 years of service. He has served on both traditional SEAL teams, taught as a SEAL sniper instructor, and served on teams that specialized in undersea operations whose missions must be approved by the President of the United States. He led major combat operations ranging from protecting the interim Iraqi elected officials to direct action missions across Baghdad. After retiring from the military in 2018, he realized that he was suffering from physical and psychological symptoms that negatively impacted his well-being and quality of life. Migraines, severe anxiety, chronic pains, difficulty focusing, difficulty sleeping, falling asleep, and depression are some of the symptoms he struggled with on a daily basis. Like so many others, he used alcohol and prescription drugs to mask the symptoms he had. Then he discovered CBD and it changed his life. It had such an impact on him, he started Naked Warrior Recovery to bring the highest quality products to the market and to teach the get naked mindset. Please join me in welcoming William Branham to the show. Hey, William, thank you so much for joining the show. I'm honored to have you more than anything. Uh, Extremely grateful for your service, and I can't wait to get into discussing with you about your experiences as a Navy SEAL and what you're currently doing, and I think it'll prove to be very valuable to my audience. So, William, could you just start with a little bit of an introduction about yourself? Well, first, thanks for having me on here. Um, So, just a little about me. My name is William Branham. I spent 26 years in the Navy. Uh, 23 of those 26 years, I was uh, in the SEAL teams, but, uh, you know, I would have gotten there a lot faster. I would have spent more of my time in in the SEAL teams, but uh, I made some tactical errors along the way, and I'll maybe go into a couple of those. But I'm originally from a little town outside of Meridian, Mississippi, so there's not a whole lot there. Uh, I had some kind of mentors as I was growing up, and those mentors were uh, John Wayne, Chuck Norris, uh, John Rambo you know, people like that, uh, you know, Kung Fu theater was also another mentor. So I wanted to become a, a ninja when I grew up. And I always knew that I wanted to be part of some sort of uh, small elite military unit, but I didn't really even know what that meant. Uh, I didn't, I certainly had never heard of the SEAL teams because there were no books, there were no, there was no internet, there was nothing like that out uh, at the time. Um, so I thought maybe I would be a ranger or a Marine Corps scout sniper uh, recon guy or something like that. And then someone told me about, you know, well, what about the SEAL teams? And I'm like, what's that? And they're like, oh, they jump out of airplanes. They, uh, fast rope, whatever that is, repel. I knew what repelling was. Uh, they blow stuff up. They shoot guns. I like shooting guns. Uh, they scuba dive, they swim, they do all these other things. And it's the hardest military training in the world. And I was like, awesome. Which is weird because I grew up with kind of a mediocre mentality. And I was actually on a run the other day thinking about that. I'm like, you know what? I did not grow up. I didn't have like real mentors in my life to like really look up to. Like my mentors were like the guys on TV that I wanted to, to kind of be like. And so when someone said, yeah, it's the hardest military training in the world. I was like, yeah, that's, I want to do the hardest thing in the world. So uh, maybe I wasn't completely mediocre in my, in my thinking that I wanted to be bigger and better, but I always, and I still feel the same way. I feel like I still have these mountains to climb uh, in front of me. And so I think that's like a great mentality to have to continue to just to live your life by, to never have uh, like, you know, we'll talk about, you know, SEAL training and Hell Week and things like that in a minute. And a lot of guys get to a point in, in SEAL training or, you know, you, you graduate Hell Week and you think, oh, all the hard work is done. And it's not, it's far from that. So, yeah, so that's just a little bit about me. Uh, I currently uh, live in Hawaii uh, because my last duty station was there's a there's is there is a SEAL team here in Hawaii. We do some uh, special special stuff. And then when I retired, and I'm using air quotes for retired because I've never really retired, um, I was like, well, I, this seems like a pretty good place to live. I I like surfing. I like spear fishing. I like 
Uh, I like the ocean more now than I used to because, you know, SEAL training will take that out of you. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a, a pretty good, pretty good lifestyle here. Although we, we pay more in uh, more to live uh, than anyone else. But uh, yeah, so we're now, you know, building, building other businesses and other opportunities. And, and uh, yeah, that's just a little about me. You just said one thing that I want to touch on for the audience, and it caught me off guard. You just Navy SEAL, you think best of the best, elite of the elite. And here you are saying, growing up, you had somewhat of a mediocre mentality, so to speak. I think that's a lesson that we can all take, though, that no matter where we start, it doesn't, it shouldn't limit where we can get to. So yeah. I think that was a great point to touch on. So that being said, you have what you call a more of a mediocre mentality. How does that play? I'll jump right into it. How does that play into the infamous Hell Week during Buds? So Hell Week is Hell Week is interesting. Hell Week is five and a half days of absolute misery. And just to kind of give people perspective if they haven't really heard about Hell Week, Hell Week is week depends on the structure of the class. It's anywhere between week uh, four and six of, of SEAL training. And SEAL training is 26 weeks long. Of course, it took me uh, 13 months to finish six months of, of training because I got hurt a few times along the way. But uh, um, Hell Week is, you lose about 70% of the people leading up to Hell Week. And then Hell Week, you lose another 70% of whatever that core that was left over. So. Hell Week is it's it's very hard, um, and it really weeds out guys that definitely don't want to be there. They think they do, but then they're like, you know, screw this, man. I don't I don't want to put up with this. I don't want to deal with this. And I certainly saw that. Uh, but I was very fortunate during Hell Week in that I I saw that one boat crew, and so that's how you work in in SEAL training most of the time, at least in the first phase of SEAL training, you work as a boat crew. So it's seven guys and you have this rubber boat that you carry around with you pretty much all the time. You do races in it. It's just like builds teamwork, uh, builds camaraderie, it builds hatred, it builds all sorts of different things. Um, but what you, le you learn very quickly about the guys to your, uh, your right or your left or your front or your back, because uh, while you are going through this adversity, you either rise to the occasion or you fall to uh, kind of feeling sorry for yourself. And when I first started during Hell Week, the boat crew that I was with, there were guys that were just kind of being mediocre. And I know I talked about, you know, having a mediocre mentality growing up because I didn't know any better, really. Um, but I knew, like, I started to learn better and I started to see people who were performing well above mediocre they were performing awesome and uh and but you know what i saw a lot of those people quit during during seal training and i couldn't put my finger on it. i couldn't figure it out uh, but then during hell week i saw one boat crew that was winning like every single race and this starts you know hell week starts sunday night and finishes friday afternoon sometime and uh and it was like all sunday night i'm seeing these guys win and then monday morning and monday afternoon i'm seeing them win and i'm with guys that i like them which is part you know part of it is your your it's based on your height because you carry this boat on your head and most guys about three weeks after hell week they're all you know have these big bald spots maybe that's what happened to me um but you know, the guys were just wanting to quit. They didn't want to put out, they didn't want to try to win the races because what's the point of winning the races? We're still going to be punished anyway. Well, if I get to sit down for five extra minutes, that's awesome. Uh, so we lost enough people all the way up until Monday, late Monday afternoon before dinner of Hell Week. And I'm like, I want to be in that boat group because those guys just continue to win no matter what. And so we had to readjust who was in boat, what boat crew and it was all based on height. And so I, I was like, okay, I want to be in boat crew three. I'm in boat crew four right now. I want to be in boat crew three. So I'm like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven guys per boat crew. That's boat crew one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, boat crew two, boat crew three, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, I'm, I'm number five in boat crew three. And then I saw someone else kind of squeeze in the same way that I did because they, they saw what I was seeing. And we won almost every single race for the entire rest of hell week. And that's not a small feat. That's, that's kind of a big deal. And it didn't matter 
if we were if we started in the back and we're going to chow and we would if there was a gap between the boat in front of us and the boat in front of them we would pass them and, and just work our way to the front in everything that we did and so the lesson that i learned from there is it sucks whatever you do in life sucks it's going to be if it's worth doing it's probably going to be hard and it's, you're going to you're going to struggle and you can either suffer in the front and be awesome or you can suffer in the back and be mediocre and so that was the lesson that I learned during Hell Week. I was surrounded by these, by these guys that they didn't care how much it hurt or how bad they felt. We all felt bad. We all felt sorry for ourselves. At some point during that, um, during, during Hell Week, like running and my stomach hurts and my legs are on fire and I don't know if I can do this, but I'm just going to keep going because I don't want to let the team down. And so everyone else had similar uh, times where they felt sorry for themselves, but they all, every single one of us, without he's talking about it, we all knew that it was better to suffer in the front than suffer in the back. William, during that, you mentioned about the other guys and like the attrition and the quitting, right? Does that impact you mentally at all during that? As you, I think it's easier sometimes to maybe suffer in the back when you see all these people that are failing. Does it ever cross your mind to maybe sit back and suffer in the back with them? Or are you that hell bent on no way it actually pushes you to go the other way and lead from the front? That I think that was something that I, I had to work through. And I actually learned it during hell week was that it doesn't matter how much it sucks, how bad you feel, because I did like most of my time leading up to hell week. Well, first off, in the class that I went through Hell Week with, I was injured. Mm -hmm. I got injured the class before, but I never healed up. And they were like, well, if you aren't in this class, then you're, then you're gone. So I'm like, okay, well, fine. I'll just go through the, I'll just go through training injured. And in the beginning of my buds career, my still training career, I felt sorry for myself a lot. I'm like, oh, that should have, maybe I should have trained harder. I should have whatever. My lungs are on fire. Like this is hard to keep up in this soft sand. And I felt sorry for myself and I fell back and I paid the man for it, but I never quit. I mean, I did those little micro quits, I guess, along the way when I was like suffering in the back. Uh, and I remember like clear as day. And I remember the, the place I was, uh, who it was and what I was thinking when one of the instructors ran up next to me and he was like, hey, man, it's easier to keep up than it is to catch up. And so and that like that still plays in my mind every single day it's easier like so we run in, in in groups and you get kind of this slinky effect where like the guys in the front have the advantage but they could also get tired and start falling back which makes the whole train kind of like the slinky effect so you're always playing catch up the further back you are and so um once i learned that and i had the confidence to actually push through the pain i was able to like start in the front of the pack and then end in the front of the pack but it was but there's always this uh you're always in a battle in this mental battle of like feeling sorry for yourself and like giving up and quitting just a little bit uh or just to like push through it and keep going and if you just push through it and keep going you always have more in the tank than you think you do you may think that you're like on fumes you get you still got you've still got some more it's whether you want to do it or not and once i was able to crack the nut on that and and get comfortable enough uh, being that uncomfortable or embracing the suck or whatever the, the cliche they want to use. Uh, once I, I figured that piece out and I was brave enough to accept it, then I was able to, to like, it, it didn't matter what, what we did or, or how hard it was. But it was and, the change up here. I mean, people say, you know, is it more mental or is it more physical? It's 100% of both. Hmm. Like it's 100% physical and it's 100% mental. You just have to, you have to completely accept all of it, completely immerse yourself. And then you, it, you're unstoppable. I really hope that the people listening to this and watching are, are hearing that because obviously a lot of the folks who will be listening to this and watching this aren't Navy SEALs. But I just want to say that three years ago, I was rock bottom and I've done a lot of reading about SEALs and the SEAL mentality. I'm not saying in any way I could do Budge or anything like that. But I will say this, the mentality and the things you just talked about, William, are what absolutely pushed me from becoming at 47 years old, a 260 pound man 
on medication and could barely walk up a flight of steps. I'm now that guy who is constantly pushing myself to do more. And I'll continue to keep pushing myself to do more. And I like to say this to people now, because of the mentality, I'm as limitless as I can be at this point. And I think that's all we can keep striving for. Yeah. So William, hearing all that and what you went through, just maybe a little bit, right? So now you, you're a Navy SEAL, you're out of buds. You're, was there any specific thing you can remember about your, your service or a mission in particular where you had to really rely on that training that sticks out to you that you were, that you'll say, yeah, it was my training that got me through this. And if it wasn't for my training, I don't know if I would have gotten through it. Um, I will say that, that SEAL training it, at the end of the day is it's hard, but it's not that hard. It's, okay. you know, what, you know, is, uh, and, and when I, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, but you know, hell week is hard. It's five and a half days. It sucks. You're like coated in sand the whole time. You're wet, you're cold, you're miserable. You don't sleep. Um, and, and it sucks, but you always know that it's going to end. You always know that in hell week, they feed you four times a day. So it doesn't matter how much it sucks. You, all you got to do is make it to that next meal that, you know, kind of create that small victory mm. in the real world. And, and they also, I say, we just had a guy this past weekend, Hell Week Secured, and, uh, and a, a young man did die after Hell Week. We don't know the, the cause of it or anything else. Uh, and another, another, another young man is, is uh, in critical condition. We don't know why uh, at this time, but we do know that, you know, Hell Week will, it breaks you down. But it's still a lot of safety built into that, into that, um, that evolution and into all of that training. But when you leave SEAL training and you're doing workups for, you know, for whatever deployment, I've been colder, I've been more miserable uh, in training environments in the SEAL teams than I ever was in SEAL training. Like SEAL training is just a selection course to see if you have the grit to keep going once you get into the SEAL teams. I've been on missions where we thought we were going to go out for a couple of hours and we didn't bring a whole lot of extra stuff with us. And we're still out there several days later, uh, weeks later, still working and operating. We didn't, we never had an opportunity to go back and like grab a sleeping bag or, you know, get some extra food or whatever. We just had stuff delivered to us out in the field, whatever, where we were, uh, so we could keep doing the mission that we fell into. Like we went to go do this, but the mission changed and we had to do something else. And so that can really mess with you uh, when you think that, okay, I'm only going to be out here for a few hours and you're still out there days and weeks later. So it's, it's the SEAL training is just, again, it's just the selection course to see if you have the grit and the grind. But, you know, the real world has a completely different idea of what uh, you should be doing sometimes. Okay, so... As you stand there, I, I think everybody can see it. Love the shirt. Get naked. So naked's an acronym. And I was reading about this last night. I love the acronym. I love what each of those letters stand for. Could you talk us through each of those letters a bit? Sure. Sure. So if your listeners uh, go to uh, the website, the number five, Seal Secrets, S-E-A-L, like Navy Seal, fivesealsecrets.com. Uh, put their name and email in there. I'll send a copy of, of what we're talking about. But um, to kind of give you an idea of what Naked really is all about and, and, and why I started Naked Warrior Recovery is when I transition, you know, I talk, you know, it sounds like I have my, my, my shit together uh, over here, you know, mentally hard and I've done a lot of hard things. But I'll tell you, when I left the military, it was kind of like, uh, if you've seen the movie, the movie, uh, the Avengers, where Thanos like does his thing and he makes half the world population go away, where you're mm -hmm. having dinner, dinner with your family and then like they're all gone. And that's kind of the way it was when I left the military, when I left the SEAL teams, I had a badass mission, I had a badass team, I had a purpose, I knew what I was going to do when I woke up in the morning. And when I went to bed, like I knew everything about, I had purpose in my life. When I left the SEAL teams, and it wasn't because I wanted to, it was because the Navy was like, all right, you've been here long enough. See you later. Make room for the new blood. 
I lost everything. I was completely lost. I had uh, no purpose. I didn't have a mission. I didn't have a team. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life or how I was going to do it. And so I certainly went to pretty rock bottom. And I have some other uh, toxic things happening off to the side. And so I would just, you know, turn to alcohol as sort of my, my drug of choice or my medicine of choice at the time. And I would pretty much drink myself to sleep at night. Eventually I got my act together and that just went through a whole litany of, you know, trying to build my new SEAL team, uh, you know, figuring out what my purpose was, what my new, what my new, who my new, my new team was, what my purpose was, what my new mission was. And through that, I figured out, you know, I used the, the naked warrior you know, it's a guy that uh, went into combat wearing, which was the predecessor of today's Navy SEAL. He's wearing like a, a, a belt with a K-bar knife on it. He had a swim trunks. He had fins. He had a mask on. And he went, he was like, you know, went into combat with pretty much naked. And, you know, it took a lot of bravery and a lot of uh, preparation to do that. And I was like, I need to embrace that somehow. That's my heritage. Uh, and so, but I realized I was walking around with a lot of ego on a lot of baggage, a lot of like, I'm, I don't know what to do. And I'm, and maybe I'm feeling sorry for myself again. And so what I had to learn how to do is take that ego off because, you know, we, we walk, we, as general people, we walk around with ego because, uh, we feel like we're, we're being attacked in, in some way, shape or form. And what I had to learn how to do is take my own ego off set it in the corner and allow myself to be exposed to be a little bit vulnerable so I could find the healing that I needed. And that was really the genesis of the kind of get naked mindset. And then, you know, as I, as I, as I'm trying to figure out like, what have I learned throughout my time in the SEAL teams that's going to uh, help me and maybe help other people get where we need to go. And so I, I created the acronym, you know, I took naked and turned it into an acronym because we're, military people love acronyms. Uh, it makes things easy to remember. And so the acronym naked, it stands, for, the N is for never quit. The A is accept failure. The K is kill mediocrity. The E is expose your fears. And the D is to do the work. And I can kind of go into each one of those uh, really briefly. So the, the never quit. Everyone says never quit. No one tells you how to do it. So I don't mean never quit smoking or drinking or bad habits or toxic relationships or anything. I mean, never quit trying to improve your life. If you've made a conscious effort to start something, you have made a conscious effort to finish it. If it was good enough to start, it's good enough to finish. But there's, you know, it's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult. And so what I say is to create small victories. And I, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier. So, for example, during Hell Week, they feed you four times a day. doesn't matter how much it sucks. All you got to do is make it to that next meal and you won. You created a small victory. One more meal, one more step, one more thing, one more email, whatever it is that you're doing in your life. Take that challenge, that thing, that project, that program, that whatever it is that you're, you're doing, you're working on, that made, you made a conscious effort to start because it's hard and not many other people are going to do that. And you're going to be overwhelmed. That's okay. Break that thing down into bite-sized chunks something that you can attack every day that you know you're going to finish and finish one of those things every single day. You can do two or 10 of those things, but finish one, create that small victory. And the more of those you create, the closer you get to whatever the end result is. So that's what I mean by never quit. The A is accept failure. Failure has been the biggest, the biggest teacher of my life. If you were to give me $10 million in exchange for my failures, I'll tell you to keep your, keep your money. I'll make my 10 million. I don't know how yet, but I will. Um, so, and, you know, kind of going back to guys quitting SEAL training, one of the things that I realized pretty early on, or I learned pretty early on, are these guys, many of these guys made it look super simple. They, like, they were effortless runners, effortless swimmers. They could fly around the oak course. They were charismatic. They looked good, you know, Greek gods out there on the beach. And they were really good leaders, what I quit thought were, uh, was a good leader. Uh, and they made everything look super easy. I was struggling the whole time. But it doesn't matter what you do or how good you do it in SEAL training, you're going to fail. You're going to be told you're not good enough. You're not loud enough. You're not fast enough. You didn't work as a team. You didn't whatever fill in the blank. You're going to fail every day and generally multiple times a day. Guys were quitting because they couldn't stand the thought of being told they weren't good enough. And so once I figured that, I was like, really? How? It's, you're supposed to fail. It's supposed to be hard. 
but they couldn't take they, they you know Jocko Willing talks about discipline equals freedom these guys were incredibly disciplined they showed up in incredible shape they were used to you know working really hard and being rewarded for their uh, accomplishments you don't get that in SEAL training you don't get that in buds you get you work really hard and you're going to fail and you work really hard again and you're going to fail and you're just going to fail until one day you're going to succeed and you're going to go, oh, okay, that worked. So let's keep doing that. But they never made it to that point where they were allowed to succeed. So that's part of accepting failure. Learn those lessons from those failures and then use that as a foundation. You know, sometimes I call it like, you know, each failure is like a rung, a rung on the ladder or it's another step to get a little higher, to get over that obstacle that's in front of you. And if you want to talk about like, you know, non-seal failures you look at michael jordan he's missed more than nine thousand shots in his basketball career he's lost more than 300 games missed 30 plus game winning shots what did he do after the games did he go party with the team and celebrate no what he did is he went back to the gym and he practiced those shots that he missed until he in every scenario possible until he didn't miss them anymore so he accepted failure but the chaos kill mediocrity because you know we're like quite honestly we're at war with mediocrity in in society you know, uh, technology has created ease of movement and ease of doing things, but it has also made it easy to not do things. And when we, you know, you can hit a button on your phone and order ice cream, but you can't, um, but you can't hit that button on your phone to make you go work out. You can't hit that button on your phone to make you go return that email to go finish that thing that you said you were going to do today. And so every time you make an excuse to not do something, uh, it's generally because your ego, you're, you're, you're not competing with your ego because your ego knows every, your, your strengths, your weaknesses, it knows exactly what to tell you to make you not do something. And that's when we become mediocre and our ego gets in the way. And that's also part of kind of this get naked mindset, this, this concept of taking your ego off and setting in the quarter. So what I tell people is to compete, compete in kindness, compete in generosity, compete in gratitude. Like those are three great things you can compete in just to make your life better. And then when you compete with those things, then start competing with your ego. And when you start winning the war against your ego, the war with your ego, You'll kill that mediocrity in your life. The E is expose your fears. And I don't mean lions and tigers and bears. I mean like the fears that swirl around in the back of your mind. Those fears that you keep buried that you don't want to share with anyone, that you don't want to tell anyone about, you don't want anyone to know about. Those are the fears, those noises, that thoughts that come out when you're driving in your car by yourself, when you're laying in bed at night, you can't go to sleep, you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about these things. Those are the fears and I look at those fears to be like a vampire. A vampire lives in the darkness and it sucks the life out of you. Those fears are doing exactly the same thing. Those fears, they live in the darkness in the back of your brain and they're sucking the life out of you. And how do you kill a vampire? Kind of like the sun is shining on me right now. You expose the vampire to sunlight and you kill it. Fear is exactly the same way. You expose your fears and then you kill them, or you at least are, have the ability to take control of them. And just to kind of give you an example. So if you have a, um, you know, maybe you were, you were beat up as a kid, you were, you were bullied, you have low self-esteem, go take a Brazilian jiu-jitsu class for a year. You're going to be forced to fight someone every single night that you go to class in a safe environment. You're going to learn a skill set to learn how to get better in defending yourself. And in that process, you're going to, you're going to get better. You're going to meet people who are going to want you to get better, all of these things are going to increase your self-esteem because you expose the fear of being beat up or being bullied or whatever. Maybe you have a fear of public speaking. Take an acting class. Take a, uh, a um, uh, public speaking class. You're going to learn very quickly. Most people are afraid to speak in public because they think people are going to judge them. Or You're going to learn very quickly. <laughs> do a podcast. Exactly. Uh, you're going to learn very quickly that the people that are in your class they want you to succeed. They want you to get better. Just like that Brazilian jiu-jitsu class, they want you to get better. And so by exposing those fears, you're going to, uh, you'll be able to control them and then they will no longer be able to control you. But it's not a one-trick pony. You have to do it over and over and over. Uh, it's funny, like right before this call, I was in a, uh, I, I, I do a lot of uh, coaching. I pay for coaching. I also do some coaching. 
and I was in a coaching class and um, one of the girls in my, in my coaching mastermind, uh, she is a TikTok superstar. She's a real estate agent. And um, when she first started getting in front of the camera, she wasn't that good. And after doing it for about a year, she leans into it and she becomes 10X the person that she is in real life to the camera. But that comes across very powerfully. But, she was, but it took the repetition. It took continually getting in front of the camera and, and doing what she was doing to get better at it, to expose those fears of, of, uh, that, that she had about you know, how someone might think about her, uh, what other real estate agents might think or other people thought about the videos that she was making. She doesn't care anymore. She does not give an F. She's like, let's go. But that was exposing those fears. Um, and, you know, kind of lastly, on the kind of exposure fears, you know, one of my, one of my business coaches, uh, he says that fear does not exist on paper. And some people, you know, they want to talk about their stuff. Uh, but he's like, I don't want to talk about it. Or maybe sometimes I do. But if I'm driving along and all these stresses and anxieties are just like swirling around in my head and I can't get control of them, I'll pull over, go to Starbucks order a coffee, sit down with a pencil or pen and a piece of paper, not my phone, not anything else. And I'll write out exactly what is bothering me, exactly what those thoughts are. So there's like this magical thing that goes from your brain down your arm and into that piece of paper that once you put that fear, that stress, that thing that's bothering you on that piece of paper, you've just exposed it. And now you control it. And when you read it, you're going to be like, really, that's really what was bothering me. And I've, I've done this many times and it works amazing. But again, it's not, you can't do it once. You have to do it over and over. It's like working out. You can't have big muscles if you don't continue to go to the gym. You can't lose that weight unless you continue to go to the gym and keep working and keep eating healthy and keep doing the things. So it, it's, it's repetition, it's effort, uh, but you expose your fears, you will eventually control them and they will no longer control you. And the D is to do the work. And we kind of talked about this a little bit uh, in the beginning. When I graduated from BUDS, from SEAL training, I thought the hard stuff was done. I thought it's going to be easier from here, and I couldn't have been more wrong. You know, there's a saying in the, in the SEAL teams that says to earn your trident every day. I didn't have that mentality. I was like, I'm, I'm good. I think I'm pretty good. And I couldn't have been more wrong because when I showed up at the SEAL team, I learned very, very quickly that you're expected to perform better today than you did yesterday. And that's why they say the only easy day is yesterday. It doesn't matter your rank, uh, how long you've been in, your age. They don't, no one cares about that. They expect you to perform better today than you did yesterday. And so it's awesome to have that accountability. We don't have it in today's society of instant gratification. We don't do the work like we're supposed to. Uh, you know, there was a saying, there's a saying out there that Rome, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, but I guarantee you it was built every single day until it became an empire. And so that's really what do the work is. So really, if you want to think like a Navy SEAL and you want to have the get naked mindset, you have to never quit. You have to accept failure. You kill mediocrity, you expose your fears and you do the work. Even all the reading I've ever done, you come at it, in it with a different perspective even today and it's helpful. And I'm really hoping that it helps a lot of people listening. Would I like to use the last little bit of time we have now? You get out of SEALs. Now you start Naked Warrior Recovery. Can you talk to us a little bit about that reason why you started it? And then tell us a little about exactly what you're doing. Because again, I'm interested in this too. And I think what you're doing is actually not just for veterans. I think this is actually helpful for everyone. Yeah, uh, I agree hundred percent. So Naked World Recovery is a CBD company. And the reason I started this CBD company was because like I talked about earlier, when I, when I got out of the military, when I retired, air quotes, um, I was lost. I was using alcohol to drink myself to sleep at night, pretty much, uh, to turn off that noise in my head. And I had heard about CBD, but I was terrified of it because of, you know, I'm a child of Nancy Reagan's war on drugs. Just say no. Mm. Uh, this is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. I still remember the commercials, the whole thing. And so I was, you know, and I had heard about CBD when I was still in the military. But, you know, top secret clearance uh, derived from marijuana or whatever, uh, not a good plan for me. So I continued down the alcohol bandwagon. I eventually retired and I still didn't do it for another year. And when I finally tried CBD for the first time, 
uh, it was because a friend of mine gave it gave me a bottle and it was right after CBD became legal federally after the passing of the, the farm bill of 2018. And, um, and so I don't know if I'd notice anything right away. But what I noticed after about a month of using it, so the bottle lasts about a month, you use the one, one dropper a, a, a night or a day or however you use it. What I noticed is my uh, water boils at 212 degrees, I was probably living at 210 degrees. And so over the, that 30 days or so, I went from like 210 to 205 to 200 to 195 to 190, maybe 185. I'm not really sure. I just noticed that my fuse got a lot longer. It took me longer to hit that boiling point with the same triggers that were coming in that would just like kick me right over into like uh, anger. Um, so I, that got better. It, what it did is it turned down that noise in my head so I could have better positive self-talk, which is how I was able to come up with the get naked mindset. Um, and also aches and pains. I'm 100% disabled through the Veterans Affairs, which really, if you add everything up, I'm 250% disabled. And when I've gone back and looked, I don't even have all of my uh, injuries documented in, like, turned into the VA. So um, I'm, but so I wake up very sore all the time. Uh, and what I found is that pain is just, turn down a few notches while I'm on CBD. Uh, so I stopped taking it because I ran out. It's, it's an expensive product. And then I started um, going back closer to that boiling point and pain started getting worse again. And so I tried a different brand. I had uh, a similar result. And so I was like, I am really like, maybe it's placebo. I don't know. I don't actually care because my quality of life is so much better. So I'm super interested in, in this industry. I meet someone, she says, in the industry, she says, well, why don't you start your own CBD company? And I said, I don't know how to do that. And she said, you're a Navy SEAL, go figure it out. And I was like, may I please have my man card back, point taken, I'm gonna go figure it out. And while I was researching the industry, I found out that it's, it's very wild west, it's very, um, a lot of unethical players out there and it's very dirty. Um, so much that the FDA has gone out and done a ton of spot checks, thousands at this point, where they found that most products, more than 70%, they don't have CBD in the product at all. Uh, they don't have the CBD they say they have in them. They have high levels of heavy metals, mercury, arsenic, lead, things like that. Maybe they have high levels of THC, which means it did not come from the hemp plant. It came from the marijuana plant. Um, there are uh, pesticides, herbicides, things like that. And that's because uh, the hemp plant is a bioaccumulator. It, it, it pulls all the good stuff out of the soil. It pulls all the bad stuff out of the soil. So you want to make sure that you're getting your, if you're going to do CBD, get it from a, a trusted source, a trusted farm um, with, that has ethical practices. And so we've, we're, we've been in this industry for a little while now, and it's starting to get better. But our goal was to have the highest quality CBD on the, on the market. And someone has asked me before, like, hey, what's the difference between your CBD and the CBD I get at the gas station over here? Because it's like cheaper and it's whatever. And I was like, what's the difference between the sushi that you get from a sushi house and the sushi that you get from the gas station? Do you really want to roll the bones with gas station sushi? No. CBD is the same way. Like, you don't know where that's coming from. So all of our products, we have a QR code on the back. You can see the third-party uh, testing uh, we post most of them on the website. Sometimes we forget uh, for every single batch. If you're buying, if you go to a website and they don't have many batches of every product uh, that they're that they've put out there that they're uh, selling, then you should probably leave that website. Um, there's some really great companies and there's some really bad companies. Uh, our company, our mission at Naked Warrior Recovery is 22 to zero. So what that means is 22 veterans take their, their life every single day. And, you know, we all need a purpose. We all need a mission. And that's kind of what I was talking about in the beginning. I lost my purpose. I lost my mission. And now my mission is that 22 to zero, you know, CBD is part of it. Mindset is, is the other part of it. And so I'm, I'm partnering with, you know, different uh, nonprofits to, uh, to help reduce that number. And someone asked me once upon a time, what's a win for you? If I can make 22 to 21, awesome. If I can make 22 to zero, even better. 
So uh, that, that's that's our mission. That's where we stand. And and you're right. CBD is not just for veterans. It's not just for first responders. But it's just the um, it's just the mission that we're on. And it doesn't matter. You can be a soccer mom. You can be a real estate agent. You can be a, a podcaster. You're going to have stress. You're going to have anxiety. CBD is a modality to help turn down the noise to to help uh, to to kind of help maybe bring you back into a little better mental mind space. Some of the things you just said, obviously, I think there's a misconception out there about it. Um, the one thing you mentioned right off the bat was that I think so many people, when they hear of it, they associate it right away with marijuana. So, William, do you think for I'll, I'll use myself as an example. And I definitely think it could help me as far as some of my stresses with my my obviously my career. What I do is, it, is for my work. Um, but also I suffer from pretty bad sciatica. I've been curious about actually trying it to see if that might help lessen that somewhat too. And I think I am going to try it. And I think hearing the rigor that you guys go through, I'm going to try it from your company and give it a shot and see, uh, see how it helps. So I am going to give it a shot. Um, I would say I'll, I'll tell you this CBD works differently for everyone. And I'll, I'll go into some quick bro science Okay. Uh, so every mammal has what's called an endocannabinoid system. So it's a giant neuroreceptor that's connected to every other system in your body. Think your, your central nervous system, your respiratory system, your digestive system, your immune system, lymphatic, like all the systems. Your body makes endogenous cannabinoids, which CBD is a cannabinoid from the cannabis plant. Hemp is, the cannab is a cannabis plant. Um, but you make endogenous cannabinoids to help feed that endocannabinoid system. And the reason that people think that CBD or make the claims that CBD cures cancer or all sorts of other things, it doesn't do any of that. What it does is it helps reduce chronic inflammation and it goes in and it feeds this endocannabinoid system that you have. And so once that comes back in, like what it does, basically it brings the endocannabinoid system back into homeostasis and allows your body to heal itself. But it does have, uh, you know, it does affect, it does help people with, with um, chronic disease because it reduces chronic inflammation. It helps with uh, certain kinds of depression. People have been able to get off of, of, of uh, opioid kind of medications using CBD. I'm not making any medical claims here, uh, but it, it works differently for everyone. Some people can take a little bit and have huge effects. Some people have to take quite a lot to have small effects, but whatever the effect is, as long as you're getting better, I think is, is a good thing. So for you, I would say probably maybe some sort of uh, a tincture ingestible, um, maybe even this product, the, the M60, which I've, I've gotten some really amazing feedback on this for people with carpal tunnel and other like hand uh, arthritis uh, and probably like some sort of topical for the, for the sciatica. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely, I, I appreciate that. I'm going to give it a shot. So William, I'd like to end on this note. I mean, you've been so gracious with your time. I really appreciate that. Let everybody know how they can find your site, find your products, things like that. Yeah. I mean, for sure. Five seal secrets.com is go download that, that document. And I'll, just a quick story about that is um, I shared that document with a buddy of mine who's in the outdoor apparel industry because he was, he was having a lot of issue. Like he's having issues with his ex-wife, uh, but he was also having issues with the CEO of the company and he's in charge of product design. Mm. And, you know, they had just gotten a bunch of, of VC capital in, infused into the company. And they're like, okay, we need to like double our, you know, everything quarter over quarter. And so a lot of pressure from the VC to the CEO down to the team. And so my buddy, Jim, I'm, I was talking to him and I was like, Hey man, let's, you know, I was trying to strategize like how to talk to your CEO. And I was like, okay. And also like, check out my five seal secrets and, and let me know what you think. And maybe they'll be applicable in your life. And he, he downloaded it. He printed it out. He laminated them. He put them on his wall. And then he went in the next day and talked to his CEO and he went in and he said, listen, Joe, whatever the CEO's name is. He's like, listen, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to perform for you. So number one, he took action. He took charge of the meeting right away by being vulnerable because the CEO was like, holy moly. First off, why are you saying you're afraid? And number two, why are you being honest? No one does either one of those things. So let's talk about that first before we even start this meeting. He was like, oh, my buddy, five seal secrets, la, la, la. And so now that's, that is, 
kind of proliferated throughout the company there. And that's part of their, their company culture. Um, so five seal secrets.com name, email, I'll send it to you right away. Um, for CBD, if you go to nw-recovery.com or nakedwarriorrecovery.com, uh, you can find uh, CBD products. And uh, let's see, Instagram, uh, Naked Warrior Recovery, all one word, or at Naked Warrior Recovery, however you say that. And I'll tell you what, let's give, uh, let's give your, your listeners a 20% discount since oh, we're thank right you. here. Yeah, thank why don't we do it, uh, Bear 20. Okay. Sounds B-A-R-20. good. B-A-R-20. I love it. I love it. I'll probably use it myself. Am I allowed? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. No. Thank you. I appreciate 100%. that. 100%. Yeah. Um, well, William, thank you again. Uh, I hope everybody enjoys this as much as I have. I think this episode is full of information. I just, and it's information that will help change your life. And trust me when I tell you this, I've been reading about stuff like this involving Navy SEALs for a while now. And having a chance to speak to William, it just really reiterates that all this, it's its not bullshit, honestly. It is stuff that will help change your life. You just have to incorporate it. And look, none of us are going to claim that we're Navy SEALs, but for the average person, guess what? You incorporate some of this into your life, you're going to be a better person every day for it. So William, thank you again for everything and you take care. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me on the show again. Thank you. This has been the Bear Essentials. Thanks for listening. And remember, never hibernate on your goals. 